there's going to be some point in your life to where you have that moment. Usually it's when you're younger to where you just put a little bit of disappointment in your father, right? Like he's just like, son, I'm, I'm really disappointed in you like right now because you did this thing or as such. And I feel like this is what I feel towards Dignitas. I'm just incredibly disappointed. <laughs> but what makes it worse is that usually this happens a little bit younger in your life. Dignitas is like a 40 year old <laughs> that I'm just incredibly disappointed in. <laughs> and it it seems like they have no future game plan for their life. They're just a deadbeat degenerate. They've been divorced like four times. They got like eight kids with like three different wives. <laughs> it's just a train wreck. <laughs> That's what I feel like Dignitas is. <laughs> so with this roster, I feel like it's ultra budget, right? Because when you look at all the other teams in the bottom half, at least some of them make sense. At least CLG makes sense in the fact that, well, they spent, I think, a lot of money in 2020 or 2021, rather, and it didn't work out. And so now they're, they have to have a budget year. And so they try and make with the best that they can do. And I thought that they actually did a pretty good job. You have FlyQuest, who are, I mean, admittedly, they're just holding on to dying dreams at this point. <laughs> And they're hoping that they can get someone from EU to try and save it somehow. I don't I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work out. It's a bad idea. And then you have Golden Guardians with the massive amounts of copium with a significant amount of their roster. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, at least Dignitas, you know, or at least rather uh, the, the rest of the field, they actually invested in their coaching staff, but I don't even think Dignitas spent a lot on their coaching staff. So it's like you aren't even building up your infrastructure to help your players at all and maybe have a fighting chance to build them up or whatnot. It's just like, no, this is a ragtag <laughs> roster, like just from the ground up. So let's get into it. It's going to be Fake God, River, Blue, Neo and Biofrost. So we're going to go from top to bottom again. Fake God, he looked okay last year. Actually, I, I, I thought he played decently well, but, but the problem is, is that his champion pool is straight asshole, like really bad. So the only two champions that he looked good on were Renekton and Nar. That's it. Like, Maybe you could make an argument to say that, eh, yeah, his, his gangplank was okay too. Like, okay, I'll give him that. Everything else just looked terrible. And so when is this guy going to be able to shore up his champion pool? And not only that, but we're going into a completely new season, completely new meta, completely new champion pool meta. So I have very little faith that he's able to shore up his pool in time for 2022. I, I don't think it's possible because he didn't really do it in 2021. So I think that's his biggest weakness and it's going to hold his entire team back, which is the worst part about it. So, and you know, in regular play, yeah, I don't think a champion pool is that necessary, right? Like you're playing in ranked games or whatever. That's fine. You're not going to get banned out, but when you play in pro play, those bands suddenly when they come out onto him it's going to put his entire team in detriment and they're going to have to pick up the pieces for him and so he's just going to become an entire liability and like this is just what happens in pro play so if he's not able to fix this issue it's going to affect his entire team and it might not look like it you know like in the game that he's affecting them you know to a grasp uh, you know, like a great extent, but everyone's going to end up getting shitty matchups then, or having to, you know, have him first pick, uh, some champion that probably isn't even worth first picking. So yeah, I, I think he is 
gonna have to solve this problem before 2022 occurs and i hope that he's working on that otherwise i don't have any faith in fake god at all uh which is appropriate so <laughs> river is coming in from psg talon uh in the pcs so interesting thing about this guy i guess is the fact that he won spring he won summer he did well at msi i think psg plays like fourth or fifth something like that so that's that's great and all and this would be a decent gamble i would say to to take a pawn but what i'm wondering is who he's going to communicate with because this is a, a this is actually a korean player so he's from korea and then he went over to psg talon so who is going to be able to communicate with this guy no one on the coaching staff can right the assistant coach the head coach they don't speak korean as far as i know and then you have the whole entire lineup i don't think any of them can speak korean so like who's really going to be able to to communicate with this guy is it because he was in psg talon that maybe they're expecting someone like i don't know neo being able to bridge the gap or something like i i guess that's possible uh you know neo speaks taiwanese so i i, I would assume that's what they're thinking but that's just i think a, a, a gap too far to bridge and it's it's especially true considering that now that's going to take focus from Neo playing his own game, which he's already going to have trouble with that. <laughs> and so now he's going to have to help kind of translate in game and help kind of center this guy in there and help maybe teach him, but he can't even teach him because I, I, I don't think Neo is equipped to teach anyone, at least from the gameplay that I've seen from the guy. So Realistically, I think they're going to have a problem integrating River more so than they thought initially. And I, I think it's going to be it, essentially he's going to be here under a false pretense. And we're not going to really get a good measure out of how River plays. Because on top of that, you need to be able to communicate with your entire team and tell your team what you're going to do if you're a jungler. That's like one of the most important roles for communication. So, yeah, I, I think. I don't see the logic in this type of a move, but if he comes out as like some mechanical beast somehow, um, then I, I guess that's great. But we kind of saw how that worked out with Levi as well too when he came over was that he just wasn't able to mesh. So yeah, I, I think this is going to be the same situation and I just don't see the logic in it. Blue is coming over from SK Gaming after what was a pretty abysmal year. I think they placed like ninth and then I think they placed like eighth uh, for what was it spring and then summer. So I'm confused as to why they brought this guy over. Maybe they reviewed his VODs and just saw like, no, it was actually a combination of his entire team because he didn't have that great of a roster either. So yeah, maybe you see the bright spots in that and you see that he is a good player and you're kind of like reaching into the bargain bin just to see if you could pick something up that's like a wild card. So I, I can see that logic too, but I can also see that this is a desperation play that is also based or predicated on the fact that you don't have to pay this guy a lot. So it's essentially just a budget move, but it's also like with the hopes that maybe he's some miraculous player because he was on a bad team, so he didn't get to shine quite as brightly so if you put better pieces around him which you haven't really <laughs> then maybe he'll do better so then we move on to neo i think neo is probably the worst adc in the league if not tied for the worst so you think of you know like oh yeah of course hansam is better than uh you know better than him uh there's probably this berserker guy that's going to be better than him you know but then you think of all like the newer guys danny's better than him tactical is better than him lost is better than him probably luger is going to be better than him especially what people were saying about him in academy and that he was wrecking faces in academy uh which neo really didn't do so <laughs> and he ties i think with johnson uh in terms of like that level so he's barely able 
to be in the LCS. But what's even more is that, like, so you're telling me that no one else was really that great in Academy in order to take Neo's spot? Like, like really? Is, is North American ADCs, like, really that fucking bad? It's just, it just seems so strange to me that you wouldn't take a chance on an Academy player for this year. Or, you know, if you could have picked up Luger, then you should have picked up Luger. Especially considering that might have set you up for the future, right? So, yeah, maybe you have to spend a little bit of money on him now. Uh, but at least you lock him into a two-year contract. And then, wow, now you have it set up for next year because he's probably going to be a good player. He's probably going to be better than someone like a Neo. So what you're saying with this move of not picking him up and just keeping Neo is the fact that you think there's going to be someone better next year that is going to outpace that Luger guy. That's, that's what you're betting on and you're hoping you're praying for. And I really don't think that's going to happen. I, I really don't. I think you should have just taken the chance now because everyone knows that this guy is supposed to be good. So I don't know. I think it's very strange. I think it's it's not smart business wise or business sense. Uh, and I think whoever is the general manager is kind of messing up in that aspect. I don't think that they're doing business correctly uh, just from, you know, just a logical standpoint. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I, I really I. I can't believe in Neo anymore. I thought, or well, rather, no, I, I can't believe in Biofrost anymore, which is his support. Because as I was going to say, I think CLG, he was bad in, and CLG was bad too. Like they just had some cohesive problems. I think in TSM, he was bad. And then he takes a break and he says, you know what? Fuck it. Like, I'm just going to take a break. And... So you're expecting this guy to come back at a better form than he was before. Maybe it was about that he was just grinding too much and he was playing too much. Sometimes players do actually get better when they stop playing. They just full on stop. They have to reframe their mind, you know, and because they were maybe doing the same patterns over and over without realizing it. So they need to take a break. Sometimes that, that does actually happen. But I think that Biofrost has had enough chances and has shown that he is not a S tier caliber support. In fact, I think his highs were only at about an A tier when you look at just supports all around the world and what, you know, all supports can do rather. And, you know, even though that, yeah, he did win in TSM, but that's not to say that he was necessarily an S tier support when you consider all supports. So, yeah, I, I think it's very unlikely that he ends up leveling up his game past that or whatnot, or even making it back to A tier. So I, I find it a very strange thing to actually sign this guy, maybe other than a possible brand move, but I don't even think Biofrost has that big of a brand either. Uh, maybe they're just adding his name on here just to have maybe some veteran recognition. I don't know. It Once again, this signing doesn't make any sense to me. Then you have the coaching staff. Uh, this guy, Enetron, I guess is his name. He was actually the coach for Royal Youth, uh, which was the, 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 in the Turkey League, right? Um, which he had ended up coaching Armut. He coached uh, Closer. He coached Pilot, the uh, ADC from LCK. He coached uh, Fab Fabulous, and he coached uh, Hippon. I think I'm saying that right. So... He's actually coached a lot of famous players, uh, players that are actually really good. Uh, so I don't see as to any reason as to why he can't bring that over into the LCS and start coaching over here and doing well over here. He clearly is able to coach young players, which you do have some young players on here. So I could see that thought process in there, but I, I don't see how it, necessarily meshes with all the other pieces to the plot it certainly doesn't mesh with biofrost i think fake god has run out of time i think neo has run out of time uh and i, I guess you could say yeah maybe he helps river or he helps 
blue uh, come into the fold in North America. But, I mean, other than those two pieces, it, it just seems like this is a waste for him to come over here. And I, maybe he was running out of options over in, in Turkey. I'm not sure. It just seems very weird to me that he would take take this job or that Dignitas would want him in this position. Then you have Mabry, who is his assistant coach, uh, who is actually an old school player named Impactful, who was actually, uh, he was most famous on complexity. And so I'm not really sure how good this guy is or what this guy does at all. I haven't actually heard of his name in a really long time. I looked him up on, you know, uh, Leadpedia and I was like, oh, Impactful, that's fucking crazy. I didn't know he was coaching. So, yeah, it's an old school name. Uh, so I, I guess there's that and the fact that he has, you know, maturity under his belt to actually help him. Uh, but, I mean, other than that, I, I just don't know how this entire coaching staff is going to pan out and how it's going to pan out with these players. I just think this is all around just a bad move uh, for Dignitas. I think it's clearly a budget year, and I think they aren't going to be trying at all. Like, they're just going to write this year off entirely. And if maybe somehow miraculously River works out or Blue works out, like, they're like, you know, hooray. Like, these, these guys, maybe we'll keep them for next year. Uh, but realistically, I think this is like a bottom two team. Uh, 